It is good to be with the saints on a Sunday morning and to do what we're doing and what we just sang about, our firm foundation, and that's really the subject of our text this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. where Peter reminds us of the importance of studying God's Word. Therefore, he writes, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. In January 1963, President John F. Kennedy gave a speech on what he called a very important subject, milk. He was speaking to the National Conference on Milk and Nutrition, and he called milk our most nourishing food. He worried about the health of Americans, many of whom were deficient in the very minerals and vitamins that are prevalent in milk. So the solution for a healthy America was simple. Drink milk. Peter had a similar speech or homily in 1 Peter chapter 2, only it was milk of a different kind, the pure milk of the Word. He wanted the saints to long for Scripture, the Word of God, and consume it. It's spiritual nutrition for our growth in salvation and the experience of salvation's blessings. And it makes us fit to participate in the Christian life, being God's temple and His priests. That's our lesson. Drink milk, drink lots of it, and be healthy and active. But before Peter gives that instruction, he first tells the saints to clear away all of the rubbish of their former life that that hinders the building of the temple. Before they could, could grow in God's virtues, they had to get rid of their vices. He lists them in verse 1, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. But he begins with therefore. It's a conjunction that joins this sentence with the previous passage at the end of chapter 1, where in verse 22, Peter instructed them to fervently love one another. The vices listed here were common among the pagans and were inimical to love, the opposite of it. Love is selfless. These are selfish. They only gratify personal desire and personal advantage. A saint is selfless. He or she loves the Lord and loves His people and should love them fervently. So Peter instructed them to put aside the habits and attitudes of the old life that are contrary to love. This word putting aside or putting off is used of taking off clothing, like removing a robe. That's an appropriate metaphor for putting an end to to harmful habits and practices. That's what happened when we were justified. We're given a, a picture of that in Zechariah 
chapter 3, verse 2, when Joshua the high priest was stripped of, of his filthy clothes. Satan is standing at his right side, accusing him when the Lord rebukes the devil and orders the angels to remove the clothing, the old garments uh, that were covering uh, the, uh, the high priest and put on him new ones. He says, See, I have taken your iniquity away. In its place, he clothed Joshua with festal robes and a clean turban. It's a picture of justification. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. An alien righteousness, not our own, not of our doing, but of the Lord's doing. It is the righteousness of Christ. Paul talks of that in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Peter's instruction here is based on that. Since they have been converted and justified, since God has removed their guilt legally and clothed them in righteousness legally, the righteousness of His Son, we are absolutely accepted by the Father at that very moment and forever. Therefore, we are to live according to that declaration that God has made that we are just, justified. As new creatures in Christ, we are to live consistently in practice, in the world, in the sight of the world, with what God has declared us to be according to what we are in His sight and how He treats us and considers us. That, in reality, is what we are to be doing continually. That's our daily life. Our daily life consists of living righteously and putting off our sinful habits. As Martin Luther said, we, we are saints, holy and righteous before God, forgiven and forever accepted by God. But at the same time, as we all know, we are still sinners. And so he spoke of us as righteous sinners. So we are to be putting off sin daily and putting on righteousness, clothing ourselves, as it were, with that which we are in God's eyes. Well, Peter didn't actually command them to put on righteousness or or behave righteously. But that follows from what he said earlier, the command that he gave in verse 22 of chapter 1, to love the brethren. Love for others should characterize us. And Christian love involves behavior. It's not merely affection. It is certainly that. It has to do with feeling and sentiment. That is a motivation in many ways for our behavior. So it's an essential part of it, but, but love is essentially action. That's how genuine affection shows itself. Putting away unloving practices is necessary for spiritual growth. We, we cannot love without doing that. And that's what Peter desired for these young Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor. And that's the, the reason for his instruction next in verse 2. So while he, he didn't tell them to put on righteousness, he did instruct them to do what would result in that. They were to long for the Word. Verses 1 and 2 are one sentence. The saints can't love one another and can't long for the Word of God while living contrary to both. So his instruction was, was leave vice, malice, and all of the rest that he listed, and long for the pure milk of the Word, just like newborn babies do. That's spiritually healthy. This is positive encouragement, unlike what we read from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, and the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 5, verse 12. Both of them use milk also, but there it's, it's of the basics of, of Christian truth and doctrine. And 
And there they both criticize these believers in Corinth and then the, the Jewish believers that were vacillating in their faith. They were, they, they were not as mature as they should have been. They were not growing as they should have been. And so they are corrected for that. Instead of being teachers as they should be, they needed to be taught the very basics of the Christian life. Instead of, of being able to, to eat meat, they had to eat or drink milk. They needed baby food rather than the food of maturity. Well, that is a proper, necessary rebuke to the saints. And we need to take that in and, and, and hear that ourselves. But here, Peter has a different motive, a different reason for what he's saying. His meaning isn't that. His meaning is encouragement. And the saints are to drink milk, take in spiritual nourishment, and do it eagerly. And I think this is the reason he probably chose this metaphor. It's to be like a baby's desire for physical nutrition. The image here is very vivid. Every parent understands it. Every sibling ha that has seen a, a, uh, his baby brother or sister brought home from the hospital has seen this image. Newborn babies want their mother's milk. Cry for it. That's a good sign. It's evidence of health. It doesn't want a pacifier. It wants the real thing. It won't stop crying until it gets it. And when it does get it, it receives it eagerly. It, it's an it's a easy thing to picture in our minds what Peter is saying. And so too, a, a hunger for God's Word is healthy. The Christian, new or old, young or mature, needs it and should demand it and settle for nothing short of it. We can't be deprived of it for long without crying out for it. It's what David expressed in Psalm, chapter four, or Psalm 42, verse 1, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. In fact, the writers of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, used that word, the word that Peter used here in David's psalm. My soul earnestly longs for thee, O God. The idea of, of the word is, um, the, of this word longs for, is intense personal desire. In fact, the word is used in James chapter 4, verse 5, of the Lord jealously desiring the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us. So we are, are not to be jealous or envious of one another, but we are to be jealous to have the right things for ourselves, to have the Word of God for ourselves. We're to be jealous for that. It's like milk for our soul, full of spiritual vitamins and minerals. The reason for that is the Word, the Scriptures, the Bible is about Christ. It's about God the Father. It's about the Spirit. It's about the triune God. That is how we learn of them and enter into fellowship with them. So we earnestly desire the pure milk of the Word because it reveals the Lord to us and is the avenue to fellowship with Him, as is prayer. But prayer is informed by, it is instructed by the Word. We cannot pray correctly if we don't know God's Word and His will. But it is the pure milk of the Word that we long for. Meaning, it is free of impurities. It's free of additives. It's free of anything that would dilute it. The pure milk of the Word. I had a friend in seminary, a fellow student, who lived with a cow in his backyard when he was growing up. His chore in the, mor in the morning as a boy was to milk the cow 
for his father's breakfast. Well, that's not easy to do. I've, I've never milked a cow, but I, I know of, of it, and I know what it's like, and I don't think I'd be very good at it. It takes some skill, and it's, it's physically difficult. And especially for a boy on a cold morning. So one morning he took a shortcut and rather than fill the pail with milk, he filled it about halfway and added water. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time, but his father immediately recognized the difference and um, I don't think he spared the rod on my friend. Well, what Peter recommends here and what he says we are to desire is pure milk, unadulterated truth. We, are, we will long for that if we're healthy. And if we want to grow to be healthy spiritually, we will long for the pure milk of the Word. Every word there is important. Not just milk, pure milk, which is the Word. When I was uh, a month out of high school, 1967, my father brought us here, actually not here, brought us to Believer's Chapel, but at that time it was on Midway Road. A year or two later, we moved over here. We had attended a church here in Dallas for a number of years, but my dad became acquainted with Dr. S. Lewis Johnson enamored of Dr. Johnson, enamored of his teaching. And so he brought us here where jo Dr. Johnson taught the pure milk of the Word. That's what my father wanted for himself. He wanted it for us, and I'm grateful for my father's wisdom. What a privilege for myself to have been nourished for so long by such teaching. Milk and meat, that's what we got. And that's what, that's what you should be getting from everyone who occupies this pulpit. Now the goal given here is so that by it, by the Word of God, you may grow in respect to salvation. Not grow more saved. We can't be more saved than we are at the very moment of faith. We are justified at that moment we are fully forgiven of every sin, past, present, and future. We are considered righteous and fully, completely accepted by God at that moment. We don't, we don't increase in our salvation. We don't become more and more saved, in other words. But we do grow in respect to salvation in that, in our understanding of it, and our experience of it, and our maturity of it, in it, we grow, we expand. As when a child is born, he or she can't be more human than at that moment. But the infant grows into that from infancy to childhood to adolescence, then adulthood, from infancy to maturity. <clears throat> and so it is with our salvation. We, we grow up into it and into our relationship with the Lord. Our understanding of it expands. Our relationship with the Lord expands and grows. But it grows only, only by the nourishment of the Word of God. His special revelation. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of Christ. You want stronger faith? You want an expanded understanding of the, the world we live in? And more importantly, of the Lord God who rules it? Study the Word of God. Sweat over it, as Mike Black told us this morning. Dig into it. Then in verse 3, Peter gave another reason for his instruction to long for the pure spiritual milk. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The translation of the New International Version may be better now that you have tasted, or it can be translated, since you have tasted. Peter wasn't questioning 
that uh, they had or had not tasted God's kindness. He assumed that they had. He's called them, begins the book by calling them God's chosen. So since, or now that, may give more the, the idea of what Peter meant. Since you've done this, you must grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. Kindness, this is, as the New American Standard Bible translates it, is a correct translation, but I think a more literal translation is better and would be the word good. So, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, that's a quote from Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The psalm encourages trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David went on to say, For those who fear him, there is no want. God provides the daily needs of those who look to him. And Peter's point here is that Scripture is God's Word. And as we take it in, as we understand it, as we believe it and obey it, we're blessed. And we're blessed in many ways. We're given direction to our lives. We're given wisdom for the decisions of life. Providence favors us. The Lord provides for our needs. He is reliable. And, and we learn that. We learn how reliable and trustworthy He is as we trust in Him. We experience Him in our lives. That's what David was saying, and he had experienced it. The Lord was his refuge. We've learned a lot about that in, in the adult Sunday school class as Mike's gone through the life of David, a king without a kingdom, all these preliminary years leading up to that. Life was dangerous for him. But he trusted the Lord, and he slew Goliath. And for years... Saul chased him through the desert. David told Jonathan, there is but a step between me and death. But the Lord preserved him, saved him from Saul. The Lord who gave Goliath into David's hand delivered David out of Saul's hand. There was but a step between them, but that was sufficient. And that's what the Lord God does for His people. He protects us and He prospers us, maybe not materially as we might want, but He prospers us with wisdom and, a, and the good life, the truly good life. We can trust Him. That's what David is saying. That's what Peter is saying. Psalm 34 is all about Yahweh. It's about Jehovah. Peter translates that kurios, the Lord, and applied it to Christ, which... which acknowledges Him as Yahweh, as the Lord. The, the psalm is about Christ, and as I made the point a few weeks ago, the whole of the Old Testament is about Him. His person, His work. And we see it very clearly in the psalms. And that's what Peter is explaining or stating, or indicating. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. He never changes. He's absolutely reliable. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, and forever, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. David's life was obviously more sensational than ours. Still, the Lord blesses us in the mundane circumstances of life. He's always blessing us. We're to look to Him and trust Him. George Mueller did that. I think I often refer to George Mueller. But what an amazing life the man lived from the very beginning. Soon after his conversion, he began ministering. He was a German. He'd come to England. He'd settled in England. He had a young wife. They both became believers as young people. And they began to minister. He visited churches in Bristol, England, and he found that many Christians were weak in faith. He was on, on fire. He was zealous, and, and so many of the people 
genuine believers were weak. On one occasion, he visited with a man who, who worked at his trade for nearly 16 hours a day. His health was suffering and his Christian faith was weak, really meant very little to him. So Mueller suggested that if he worked less, his health would improve and he would have more time to read the Bible and pray. His spiritual condition would improve. The man was skeptical. If I work less, I won't earn enough to support my family. Even now, I barely make it. Wages are low. I have to work hard to obtain what I need. I think that resonates with us today. Well, Mueller thought, that's not trusting the Lord. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He quoted that to the man. He replied then to his friend, brother, it's not your work that supports your family, but the Lord. The Lord could provide for him, and he would provide for him if he gave more of his time to the Lord and to his word and less to work. Well, the man was convicted, but not convinced. And I think we can all understand that. Mueller could understand it. He understood life is challenging. But he saw something there that, that really motivated him in the direction that he took for ministry. He chose a ministry that would first and foremost prove to the church and Christians like that man that God provides when we look to Him and are obedient. That, that we can trust the Lord to do that. And so he began a ministry to orphans in Bristol. He saw a need. There was a great need for that. He had compassion and concern for the orphans but the principal reason he chose that was this will be an opportunity to demonstrate the faithfulness of God to God's people who need to learn that. So he never asked for money. He only prayed, and God was faithful. He always provided for Mueller and the orphans, and often in amazing ways. That's what David was encouraging the saints to do in the psalm. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what Peter was encouraging here. Now that you've tasted, or since you have tasted the goodness of the Lord, taste more. Drink milk and keep drinking it. It's spiritually healthy and enables us to grow up into our salvation. But especially, it produces growth in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God who never disappoints. He, the triune God, can only be truly known through revelation. His Word. And Peter writes specifically of that next in verses 4 and 5 where he writes of our coming to Christ, knowing Him as a result of our connection with Him. It begins a, a new section and subject that includes verses 4 through 10, but the passage is still connected with the previous one, the previous verses. Instead of tasting the Lord, Peter writes of coming to the Lord. The means of doing that is the same. It's through the pure milk of the Word. Peter replaces the vivid metaphor there of milk with another by describing Christ to whom we come as a rock, a living rock. It is a living stone, he says. It's based on Him. It's based on that stone, that living stone, that God's temple is built. And by, by joining ourselves to Him by faith, by joining ourselves to Him, we, may, we are made part of that temple. And what's more, we have a, a ministry in God's temple. 
in that temple as God's priests. This description of Christ as a living stone is a, an unusual expression. You just think about it, it's unusual. In fact, it's been described as a daring metaphor. For the obvious reason, that stone is not alive. It's completely inanimate. But Jesus Christ made this identification when in Matthew 21, verse 42, He quoted Psalm 118, verse 22, which refers to the stone which the builders rejected and applied it to Himself. He's that stone. In fact, in verses 6 through 8, Peter quoted three stone prophecies. I think Wayne Grudem used that expression from the Old Testament and applied them all to Christ. It's an unusual expression, but it, it, it is completely appropriate of Christ because He has the qualities of stone. It is solid, it is firm, and so it's permanent. And Christ is eternal and reliable like a granite foundation. But in addition, He is a living stone which recalls the resurrection. The builders rejected him. The ancient psalm prophesied. The priests and the teachers and the lawyers of Israel, the leaders of Israel, rejected Christ and crucified him. But God raised him to glorified life, to an indestructible life, in affirmation that he is pleased with his son and accepted His sacrifice for His people, and made Him the chief cornerstone of a new temple. In the temple of Jesus' day, what He cleansed of the money changers, and where He often taught, was a massive and magnificent building. King Herod began building it in 19 B.C., it wasn't completed until A.D. 64. It stood when Peter wrote this letter. He may have thought about that temple. I would imagine he certainly did as he wrote these words. Its, its stones were huge, beautifully cut and fit together. But it was, it was considered one of the great wonders of the world. In fact, the rabbis would say, he who has not seen the temple in Jerusalem has not seen a great building. It was great. It was magnificent. The, the disciples marveled over it, remember, at the, as they leave, and then that introduces the Olivet Discourse. But for all of that, it was inferior to the temple that's described here. Six years after Herod, Herod's temple was completed, the Romans came and pulled it all down. A few of the great stones of the outer wall remain, but the, the temple itself is long gone. It wasn't permanent. This temple that we read of here, a spiritual temple, is permanent because its cornerstone is permanent, eternal, a living stone. And all who have come to Him have become also living stones because by being joined to Him through faith, faith in the pure milk of the Word, faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ that joins us to Him, by being joined to Him, we are joined to His indestructible life. We have that. Through faith in Christ, through being joined to Him, we have eternal life and are now being built into God's house. The whole thought, beginning with verse 4 and completed in verse 5, is, and coming to Him, you are being built. We are being built up as a spiritual house. We are not a tangible inert structure that can fall down or fall into disrepair or be pulled down. We're a spiritual house, and that means this temple that we are a part of is everywhere. It's not in one location. It is wherever the people of God are. 
All through the old dispensation, Israel had to travel, sometimes the, the whole length of the land, depending on where they lived. They're up at the tribe of Dan or the northern tribes. They had to go pretty much the length, at least all the way down to Jerusalem or up to Jerusalem for wherever they were. They had to travel a long way to, uh, to get to the temple, and they were to do that three times a year. That was mandatory, that they go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple three times a year. It was required. It was the law. And now today, the temple is wherever the people of God are, because we are God's house. And as the Shekinah glory once filled Solomon's temple, the Lord lives in us permanently in a far more glorious way. We're still under construction. Peter wrote that we are being built right now. When uh, anyone comes to Christ through faith in Him, another stone is added to this spiritual house. It can't be, as I said, can't be pulled down, can't be destroyed. Christians die and can be killed. The churches of Asia Minor were suffering persecution when Peter wrote to encourage them. But as Tertullian wrote a century later, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It grew even stronger through the attempts of the Roman Empire to destroy it. The Lord kept adding stones to it. He still does. But there is a, a warning in this. Since the Lord's own nation, the builders had rejected Him, and not just the Jewish nation, the, the nations of the world rejected Him. Because of that, we who come to Him can expect the same rejection. He ends the upper room discourse, uh, John chapter 16, with that warning. Don't be amazed if the world hates you. It hated me, but fear not. Take heart. I have overcome the world. So we can expect that. Uh, expect the Lord to, uh, expect the world to reject us and just as it did him, there will be opposition. That's one reason we need to taste of the Lord, of His kindness, long for the pure milk of the Word. That is how we mature. That is how we, we grow in respect to salvation. And that spiritual maturity prepares us for life. Prepares us for what's unexpected. You and I don't know what's coming this afternoon. You don't know what's coming tomorrow or the end of the week. We don't know what the future holds. It may have an unexpected trial. That is not uncommon. It may come just like those ancient saints suffered, what they were going through. But this is how we fortify our souls by the Word of God. This is how we prepare ourselves for life and what's coming. But that preparation is also needed for our present service. We are living stones in the Lord's house. We are not inactive. We are active stones. We're living stones, and specifically here, we are a holy priesthood. And we are to be offering up spiritual sacrifices. Uh, what those are is, uh, is a proper question. We know what sacrifices were in the Old Testament. They were material offerings like a lamb or a goat slain on the altar. But these are immaterial offerings, spiritual sacrifices that we offer. We also find those in the Old Testament like offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving. But they're all through the New Testament as well. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul urges us to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Our whole lives are to be a spiritual sacrifice, an offering to Him. Paul thanked the Philippians for their, their gift of money to him while he was in prison in Rome. He called it a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. 
He uses these metaphors of the Old Testament to describe their financial gift to him, their help to him, their love for him. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, we are instructed to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips, and give thanks to his name. So, a sacrifice of praise, what is that? An offering of praise? It's prayers, it's thanksgiving, it's, it's glorifying Him, magnifying Him. Singing praise and thanksgiving is a spiritual sacrifice. Really, to go back to Romans 12, 1, everything we do as Christians is to be an offering to God from the least that we do to the greatest, whether it's eating or drinking or whatever we do, we're to do all to God's glory, from the simplest to the greatest. Our whole life is to be an offering to Him. That's our priestly service. And these sacrifices can only be done by us, that is, by Christians. Because, as Peter said... They, were, they are offered up through Jesus Christ. Only Christians, Jews and Gentiles together, born again people, believers in Jesus Christ qualify as priests. Only we have been given this great privilege. Each one of us, male and female, young and old, is a priest to God. The age of a professional priesthood, of an elite institution, ended with the Old Covenant. We are all priests because we're all saints in the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. To do what? To pray. That's what he's exhorting us to do. And that's our priestly duty. It's a great privilege to intercede for one another to offer prayers of thanks and and honor to the Lord God, and to intercede for each other. That's our priestly ministry. Now, how do we know all of this? Well, we know it by revelation, which is the only way we can know God. Know ourselves. The only way we we can know salvation, what it is, how we receive it. The only way we can know reality how things really are. It is through the Word of God because the Word of God is the revelation of the Creator. You want to know what the creation is like? You want to know what, re- what, what reality is? Read the revelation that the Creator of reality has given to us. Do you want to know the way of salvation? Read what the Savior has revealed to us. It's through the revelation of God that, that we understand truth. The world doesn't accept that. It scoffs at it. It dismisses it as foolish. That's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Because the unbeliever doesn't have the Spirit of God. And because of that, these things are spiritually foolish to him because they're spiritually appraised. They're spiritually understood and evaluated. And we have the Holy Spirit so we can do that. We have the Holy Spirit if we're a believer. And if we do, we know it is true. He testifies to our hearts that it is. That is the self-authentication of the Word of God. The child of God who has eyes to see and ears to hear, that has a new heart with a new capacity to understand, reads the Word of God and knows implicitly that it is true. That's the witness of the Holy Spirit within us. And this revelation, the Word of God, is, as I said, the means to wisdom, the means to maturity, to a life of eternal value. What you do as an obedient child of God counts for all eternity. From the simplest things to the greatest things. So, What are we to do? Drink the pure milk of the Word. And lots of it. Taste the kindness of the Lord. But if you're here without Christ, 
If you're here, having never believed in Him as your God and Savior, we urge you to do the same. Believe the Gospel. That's really the counsel of the psalm. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Believe the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of man. He tasted death for sinners so that all who taste Him, believe in Him, might have life everlasting, new life, obedient life, the best life. And then you will see that He is good indeed. May God help you to do that and help all of us to drink milk, the milk of the Word. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 26 in the songs of praise before the throne of God. Hymn number 26. Father, what a blessing to be able to sing one with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. We've been purchased. Our life is secure in him. What a blessing. We know that through your word. The pure milk of the word. Give us a hunger for it that we would learn more of you, and in learning of you, love you more, and in loving you, love your people. So Lord, we pray you'd continue to transform us. We thank you for all that we have in your Son. We thank you for all that you've done for us. For us. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.